I'm Steve Shapiro, and I've spent my life solving problems and helping companies innovate. And on today's show, we're going to explore why sometimes the best way to find great solutions is to stop focusing on solutions. Instead, you want to ask better questions. Stay tuned. Congratulations. You are tuned into Dolph Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, the number one podcast for Fortune 500 executives and those who are dedicated to creating a quantum leap in leadership. Your host, Dolph Barron, he's an executive mentor to leaders like you, a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine, CEO World, and he's been featured on CNN, Fox, CBS, and many other notable sites. Dolph Barron is an international business speaker who was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 100 leadership speakers to hire. Now, over to Dolph Barron. Welcome, dear friends, fans, and fellow aficionados of Leadership Excellence. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Leadership and Loyalty Tips for Executives. Let me ask you, what do you need to do to up-level your leadership? Well, as I'm sure you are aware, experts are coming out of the woodwork to offer solutions to all the very challenges we're facing. But have you considered that in order to truly innovate solutions, you need to clearly formulate the problems? which is something most of us don't do. Well, stay tuned because that's exactly where we're going today. I'm your host, Dolph Barron. I am the Dragonist and I'm here to assist you tapping into the one thing in your business that changes everything by transforming meaning into action. To find out more, you can simply go to DoveBaron.com. That's D-O-V-B-A-R-O-N.com. This episode of Leadership and Loyalty is brought to you in part by our other podcast, yes, Curiosity Bites. Curiosity Bites is the answer to the question, how do we bring people together who completely disagree? This is exactly what your mind and your soul have been craving. It's your chance to sit in on some real and oftentimes intense conversations with some of the world's most interesting people. I'm talking about astronauts, neuroscientists, philosophers, holy people, quantum physicists, skeptics, entrepreneurs, multi-award winning Grammy, Grammy winning entertainers, uh, fascinating folks, some of whom you may have thought of might think, well, you know, this person might be an a-hole and they're truly fascinating. It is an amazing show and I highly encourage you to, do, to find out more about it. Simply go to dovebaron.com and click there, you'll find out how you can sink your teeth into an episode of Curiosity Bites. Now remember, you can always find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or wherever you tune into podcasts. And we always appreciate you going there, rating, review, and subscribing to the show. If you're a regular listener, big thank you to you for making us the number one podcast globally for Fortune 500 listeners with a potential reach of 2.5 to 4 million listeners for every single show. Over time, we are honored and grateful to be cited by Inc.com as the number one podcast to make you a better leader. All right, let's strip it down and dive right in. There's a pretty good chance that you and I as leaders are finding ourselves in times where we're discovering a whole new set of problems. Um, and those problems are becoming, well, increasingly complex. And according to today's guest, it takes about 3,000 raw ideas to come up with one implemented solution. So is there a way to find innovative answers through formulating a problem? rather than just running around like a hair's on fire. Well, stay tuned, because that's what we're going to discover on today's show. You see, my guest on this episode is Mr. Stephen Shapiro. He has presented um, his perspectives on innovation to audiences in over 50 countries. He started his work in innovation back in 1996, when he was seven, <laughs> when he created and led a 20,000-person innovation practice of consulting for Accenture. He is the author of six books, including Best Practices Are Stupid. I agree with that one, which was named as the best innovation book of 2001. His clients include the Marriott, 3M, P&G, Microsoft, Nike, NASA. And in 2015, he was inducted into the Speaker Hall of Fame. His latest book is called Invisible Solutions. It contains 25 lenses for reframing the solutions of difficult business problems, especially during these difficult times. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and help me to welcome Mr. Steven Shapiro! <laughs> 
so awesome to be here. Thank you for that amazing introduction. I appreciate you taking the time to be with us. You know, one of the places we like to start the show uh, for all of our guests is in this world of everybody's an influencer and everybody's an expert and blah, blah, blah. Who is somebody who has really had a massive influence on you? Somebody we might not have thought of, or somebody we may, we may not think of, and somebody we may not even have considered who's had a real impact on you and your leadership and how you look at leadership. Who is that? Who might that be? I mean, I would say in, in terms of someone who's famous, it would probably be Richard Feynman because I just, the, the way he thought, the way he tried new things, playing bongos and getting rid of ants and like just the, the guy, in addition to being a brilliant, you know, physicist and everything else that he did, surely, just absolutely amazing. Surely you're joking. Surely, yes. <laughs> in case you don't know, folks, that's the name of one of his most famous books. Surely you're joking, Mr. Feynman. I loved his work, Richard Feynman. I'm a quantum physics nutter so i loved his work how did how did feynman because here you are as a you know and it's interesting right because uh, it, the, for me it makes sense based on what i know about you and about your work but feynman is a physicist who didn't look at things in the way a physicist did is that what it is yeah i think it's his curiosity i mean i really yeah. do think that he would try to do things that he were out of his range of comfort or something he didn't know. I mean, like becoming a safe cracker in Los Alamos, trying to, you know, break into some safes there, I thought was fascinating. It just, he just was never intimidated by trying something he didn't know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, from my perspective, some of the best ideas are always going to come from making connections to something that's outside of our area of expertise. So sure, he's a physicist and he knows physics better than probably anybody else on the planet, but I'm sure a lot of the work they did in physics was heavily influenced by all of these wide range of things that he did outside of the area of physics. And that's what I'm always trying to do is how do I learn from magicians when it comes to magic? Okay. They make the impossible possible. How can I tap into the brain of a magician to better understand the way that we can create things that seeming that are seemingly impossible? Yeah. You and I have this in common. And I loved uh, that conversation that we had around that around, bringing the different people in different way of thinking into a to a problem that is just most people never even consider right so like you know we talked about if you have a leadership problem look at it as a, a as a choreographer or you know and i love that you that's the the basis of your work now one of the interesting things about you and again it ties is that i guess most people wouldn't know I mean, you're, you're a leadership uh, innovation speaker. Like I said, you're you know, a Hall of Famer, et cetera. And you've written books about innovation, but your hobby is sleight of hand magic. So, so talk to us a little bit about that and what's the influence of that? Sure. So the, first of all, what I love about magic is it's, it is about problem solving. I like magic. I like mysteries. Uh, anything where you're trying to... Uh, figure out a solution to something. So a magician doesn't say, okay, I'm going to try to do something anybody else can do. They're going to try to solve the problem. How can I cut somebody in half without killing them? How can I make somebody disappear? How can I read someone's mind? Whatever it is, they're going to try to do something that mere mortals can't do. And then they're going to figure out a way to do it. Well, it's really what businesses struggle with. So when you get into that mindset, I think it's really fascinating. And I also think magic is a great way to understand the brain. There's so much written about neuroscience, but when you look at neuroscience through the lens of magic and the way magicians fool people's brains, well, we are fooled as human beings. We're fooled into believing certain things that aren't true, and that's going to be a killer of innovation. So how do we start to highlight these areas of our blind spots so that we can actually ask better questions and find better solutions? Yeah. Uh, um, there's so much there to unpack that I just would love to, like, we could go off on the magic thing and on that mystery thing which i just think is so fascinating because i am not a, magi a magician i've never practiced magic but i have lots of people who are actually members of the magic circle and you know all these kinds of things and uh people who you know i know people who are very involved in it and i studied uh, a lot on cold reading and all those things that go along with with magic and spent a long time in those kinds of things and and it's an incredibly fascinating area. One of my heroes um, is Darren Brown. I just think he's brilliant. Um, you know, and I, and I watch people like David Blaine and I'm like, that close up stuff, I'm like, 
you know, and I just love it when he does it in the street and some and people run away because they're so freaked out. <laughs> they're like, ah! It's just, it's so wonderful to see. But it is, you know, when I watch it, I don't watch it as a, just an entertainment thing. I'm like you. I see it and go, that is useful in leadership. That is useful in innovation. That's a different way of looking at it. But as you said, it's the, we are, we, I think that we are naturally trained, I know this from brain science and neurosciences, that we, we train ourselves to actually delete. We train ourselves to not pay attention. And when last time we spoke, you and I talk about, we spoke about people wasting their time solving the wrong problem. And one of the great examples you had was about an airport. I'd love for you to just share that with people because I think that's a great way to sort of kick this off for people to understand. Sure. I mean, especially now that most of us sort of long for the days when we could get on an airplane and, yeah. and, and now we're not. And we take our time. <laughs> exactly. So we, we think sort of philosophically and, and, uh, and look back on all the, the pains that we used to have while traveling and actually think of them as a joy, some yeah. strange thing. The, so the, the romantic idea of going through TSA. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. So the, the short version of the story is airport in the U.S., you know, passengers were complaining about how long it took for the bags to arrive at baggage claims. So they did what most of us would do. They would solve the problem. How can we speed up the bags? Spent a ton of money uh, on faster conveyor belts, more baggage handlers, newer technology, and they cut the time in half. They got it down to eight minutes, which you would think is, that's pretty amazing. First of all, eight minutes isn't very long of a wait. And also cutting it in half is really an incredible feat. Mm. But passengers still complained. So now they're stuck with the problem of we can't actually speed up the bags anymore without spending a ridiculous amount of money. And then they had an epiphany. They realized it took the bags eight to 10 minutes to get from the plane to the baggage carousel. But at this particular airport, it only took the passengers one to three minutes to get from the plane to the baggage carousel. So instead of speeding up the bags, they slowed down the passengers. They reconfigured the airport so that passengers would have to walk further to get to their bags. And they get to the baggage claim, bags are waiting. And what I love about this is that really it, it just highlights the, the fact that a lot of times we jump to the problem. So in this case, we thought it was the speed of the bags, but actually it was wait time. And wait time is not the same as the speed of the bags. Wait time is the speed of the bags and the speed of the passengers. So we need to just recognize there's a lot of different ways we can change questions. And we could actually riff off this one question for the rest of our time here, because there's just so much richness in any problem. We could spend an hour coming up with different reframes of a problem before we even jump to solutions. But one of the things you talked about that I thought was really important was that we're trying to solve problems that are, as we talked about, are often the wrong problems. But you talked about using innovation to to really differentiate ourselves in uh, how we solve problems. Talk to us a little bit more about that because I think that's a really important piece today in an ever commoditized world for leaders. Well, I think what happens is everybody's been so enamored in the world of innovation with suggestion boxes and idea management and asking everybody for their opinions and ideas. And so what happens is companies end up with hundreds or thousands of ideas of which maybe two or three of them prove to be valuable. So we need a better way. It comes back to where you started the conversation. 3,000 ideas, conceived ideas lead to one implementation. Well, that's a really terrible value proposition for an organization. So what we need to do is figure out, first of all, what creates value, what right. differentiates us, and then how do we find the problems that are going to actually help us differentiate? So to me, differentiation is made up of, of five things. Uh, it has to be distinctive. It's why somebody does business with us and not someone else. It has to be durable and that it stands the test of time. I know a lot of companies that have what they think is a differentiator, but then their competition just copies them. That's not a differentiator. It has to be disruption proof and that we can't have a new technology coming in like an Uber app that completely replaces the taxi industry. Right. It has to be desirable that people want to pay for it. And it has to be disseminated that everybody inside and outside the organization knows it. So when we use this as a lens for determining where do we focus our energies, uh, you know, my belief is we innovate where we differentiate. And that to me is the key. We can't be the best at everything. So let's figure out where we differentiate and put our energy there. So that, I mean, that's a, what you just put forward was a pretty powerful and robust measure. Um, and off the top of my head, I can't think of too many companies 
who could go through that, uh, particularly as in um, disruption proof, because there are some disruptions you don't see coming, i.e. COVID, <laughs> right? So, right. Um, so a lot of people thought they were disruption proof and then, <laughs> then they got hit by a pandemic and went, ah! Um, so can you walk us through an example of stepping through those five, um, how uh, any company might do that? Uh, sure. Or if you, if you know a company that has, of course. Yeah, so and I think it's since you pointed out the disruption proof, let me just point to that just for a second because sure. a lot of companies think they need to be disruptive. And that's not the case. I mean, I not everybody's going to be a disruptor. I mean, maybe a nice startup out of Silicon Valley, they'll be a disruptor, but you can't you can't as a larger organization think you're going to disrupt industries all the time. Now, maybe you'll acquire someone who is disruptive or you'll license their technology. Uh, but at the end of the day, you just need to make sure that what you offer will stand the test of time. Now, COVID sort of an unusual example uh, of a disruption. A yeah, this, this is a, just, just slightly challenging times. Uh, but you look at technology, which is often a disruptor, but it also is sometimes socio and economic shift. So, for example, if you look at insurance companies or financial services, just the fact that millennials and Gen Zers have a different philosophy on retirement and savings well, that has the impact or potential impact to disrupt. Or if you think about uh, social movements, uh, you know, however many years ago, smoking was a great thing. Now, well, not so good. Uh, sugary foods used to be a great thing. Not so much now. So we, these, these changes take place and disruption isn't necessarily a new technology or a new app. It can be something much larger than that. Uh, but I, and, and I think here's the key with all of this. Mm -hmm. As an organization, you really don't get to declare your differentiator. Your differentiator is what the market says it is. And so I've done, here's a really fascinating exercise to do. Yeah. Uh, and I've, I've done this with a, a whole bunch of different clients and the results are interesting. So what I would do is bring some of their best clients into a room yeah. and then I'll have executives from the company and we'd spend an hour with the company, the clients are quiet, listening in and the company would talk about how they differentiate. Why do customers do business to them and not someone else? What makes them special? Uh, and they'll philosophize about this for long periods of time. And then I'll have them stop and I'll turn over to the clients. It's and like, say, is this done in like an FBI room where the, <laughs> yeah. the clients are looking through a one-way mirror and the executives are saying stuff and the clients are like, woohoo. <laughs> That's actually a better strategy than I've used. I do like that. <laughs> I've not done the one-way mirror, but that's going to be that's, next time. That's next time, right. Next time. But, you know, that's, that's the general idea, though, is they're watching mm -hmm. and observing, and then the clients get to speak. And then they will say what they need to say. Uh, and in most cases, maybe there's some alignment, but it's not 100% overlap. It might be a 30% overlap. Right. But then here's where it gets really interesting is talk to the people who were customers who left you yes. and talk to people who were never customers. And then you start triangulating on the conversations between those, uh, what your current customers, what your past customers and your never customers say. And now you can start seeing, look, just because somebody's not a customer and they say they want something doesn't mean you should do it because they might be better served by someone else. And that's the way it should be. Mm. But if I think about differentiation, it should permeate everything you do. So I, I'll just, use two companies right now, just as an example, Thank you. Uh, in the insurance industry, State Farm Insurance and USAA. They're pretty much competitors, slightly different markets. USAA only provides their services to the military. But what I love about uh, State Farm is their messaging, their marketing, their advertising is consistent with their differentiator. So it's Jake from State Farm, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Their differentiator is their distribution network. They have more branded agents of anyone else in the insurance industry. And as a result, they are the largest insurance provider in the United States, especially when it comes to homeowners and premiums, because they want to know my agent is going to be very close by right around the corner to take care of me. Mm -hmm. So that's their differentiator. They put a lot of energy into that and their marketing supports that. Whereas USAA has a completely different demographic they're going after because the military, they move. They're not accessible necessarily to uh, a local agent. So USAA puts a lot of energy into how do I create, uh, how do I serve those who serve the country? It's really about service. 
right. it's about member value. And so, although this isn't an insurance product, if you are able to take a picture of a check and deposit it into your account, you can thank USAA because they have four patents on that. They own the technology for that. And they did it because they know their members aren't always going to be able to go to a bank. So mm -hmm. two differentiators, and, and both of them are spectacular in terms of their client satisfaction and things of that nature. So I just love that as inspiration to keep me focused on what really matters the most. Yeah, uh, and I think that what you pointed out there is, is key because there is so much about business that is commoditized and and i don't know of an in, i don't know of an industry that's more commoditized than the insurance industry um it's much of a muchness so the only thing separating it is how you show your differentiation because it's certainly very unlikely to be the product because the product is pretty much the same and it's that you know like you said knowing who exactly who you're going after um one of the things you you talk about in the book um and you and I agree that to find better solutions, we need to ask better questions and that we both believe that that's the, the key to problem solving. In the book, you provided these 25 lenses for reframing the problems to, to uh, just allow people to arrive at better solutions. Can you give us an example of, of a couple of those lenses and, and where people don't normally go? Where, so, Here's what we might normally do, and here's a new lens. Because I, I, I think that I know that people get stuck, I believe, and I know you do because I've seen you speak about it as well, which is that people get stuck because they're looking through their own lens. And as the great philosopher said, a fish cannot describe water. And we are busy trying to describe the water. We don't even know we're in it. And, and oftentimes, it's one of the things I say to the people who bring me in. You're not bringing me in because I'm from your industry. You're bringing me in because I'm not from your industry. That's why I can see things you can't. So talk us to us a little bit about getting them out of the, the, the frame they're in and shifting them to another frame and, and good example of that, if you could. Yeah, and, and I think that's just what you just described in terms of your value is so spot on. I mean, there's a lot of industry experts, but being able to bring experience from different industries is so valuable. And the, and the reason for that is we don't have the same level of assumptions right. that people inside of an industry have. So I, I really believe that our past experiences limit our ability to see different and potentially better futures. And so given that, uh, we could go through a process of just finding our assumptions, finding our assumptions, finding our assumptions, and that's great. But it's sometimes difficult for us, as you said, the, the fish in the water, you know, can't really look at those assumptions. So the lenses that I created are really about how do I stimulate the process of challenging assumptions? So for example, one of the lenses is the variations lens. I think right now it's a super powerful lens. Uh, and a lot of times we're asking a question, how do I solve a particular problem? Assuming that there's a one size fits all solution, like how can we collaborate or how can I engage my, my workforce when we can't meet together? Well. Right. First of all, not everybody's the same. Maybe you can meet with some people under certain circumstances. Uh, maybe there are people who have kids and therefore meeting with them during the day synchronously is more difficult. So maybe we have variations. Okay, if you can't work during the day, we'll find ways of engaging asynchronously through video and other types of chat. Uh, we'll have real-time conversations when we can. And we'll have face-to-face in-person conversations when we can. So the variations lens says, how do I serve the different needs in different ways. And when you use this, a lot of times you can optimize a business much better by recognizing that when you try to, when you design around an exception, you then sub-optimize the most frequent cases. So how do you design to handle the exception, but optimize around the most frequent scenarios? So that's just so, one of the lenses. All right. So um, just to, to make it sort of, you know, people can get their teeth into it. What would be an example of that? Um, both, you know, as in this is how they usually do it and then moving it into that lens. Do you know what I mean? Sure. Well, I'll, I'll give you a different, I'll give you a different example. And I'll show you two specific lenses. Okay. Thank you. That, that were used on that. So one was some work in the UK around the education system. So if I asked you, how do we improve the education system? You're probably going to give me, and if I asked a hundred people, I'm going to get a thousand answers. 
Sure. We need better teachers, teachers pay, classroom size, infrastructure. Now it's how do we do virtual, whatever it might be. Yep. We're going to have a thousand and one opinions as to uh, how do we improve the education system. So one of the lenses is called the result lens. And the result lens means where it's all about asking the question, what is the outcome? What does this make possible? So why do we even have an education system? Mm -hmm. So why improve something if it doesn't prove a goal, improve a particular goal? So the goal here is, let's just say for the sake of argument, child's learning. Yes. Okay, well, that's a different problem. How do we improve a child's learning is not the same as an education system. Child's learning now has a completely different range of factors. So then the next problem, the next lens we use was the leverage lens. And the leverage lens says, what's the one factor that has the greatest impact? If I could only solve for one aspect of this problem, what would it be? Mm. So when it comes to a child's learning and talking with researchers, one of the greatest factors that impacts a child's learning is positive parental involvement. Not helicopter parenting, but actually the parent being involved in the education process, like working with the child through their problems. And so when that question was asked, a solution was found in Bogota, Colombia, with a school that has 100% parental involvement in a place where people don't have a lot of money. And that solution proved to be wildly valuable in terms of the thought process. So we went from an education system, which is this big macro problem, to how do we just get parents involved? Two totally different questions. That is a phenomenal example. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And I appreciate it because, um, aside from anything else, the so the solution came from a place that people don't expect, <laughs> you know, Bogota, come on now. Right. Yeah. Some Colombian village are going to give me the answer. Yes. And I, and I love that you're challenging that bias. Um, you know, you and I spoke about this last time we had a conversation. I just think that is so detrimental in business is that, and in leadership is that we're constantly forcing our bias down, people's neck. And I love what you said in one of your presentations. You said, expertise is the enemy of creativity. Take us a little bit deeper into that one, because that was, that, that was a beautiful one for me. I was like, ooh, that's good. <laughs> well, you know, it, it's fascinating if you look at successful companies that, you know, are no longer with us. It wasn't because they didn't have money. They didn't have smart people. They didn't have, re no, they had all that but they had a past that was successful. And we, you know, in financial services, like if you watch TV commercials and say, past success is no guarantee of future success. I think it's much, much worse than that. Past success is a great predictor of future failure. Yes. If you don't challenge your assumptions. Right. Because once you start going down the path of what worked in the past is going to work in the future, you're in big trouble. And, and the reason for this is because we knew our industry, we knew our competitors, we knew our customers. It doesn't mean we know them. No. And that to me is always the fascinating thing is we get so caught up in what worked instead of looking at what needs to work in the future. But psychologically, we, human beings don't like to change. Psychologically, um, you know, we have two things. One is that we need for certainty and the need for uncertainty. And the need for certainty is we don't like to change. And the need for uncertainty is we like variety and we like to be excited, but only by what we decide it is. And we don't like it to come out of left field. And so we cling to crappy ideas. We cling to old innovations. And more importantly, I think, um, as a consultant and an executive advisor, one of the things I see is that people cling to their laurels. You know, well, this has worked for us for 40 years, Dove. You can't tell us it doesn't work. Yeah, I can. I can. No, you can't. Because we've got the bottom line sheet to show that it works. No, you have the bottom line sheet to show it worked. Past tense. Oh, well, so you're telling me it won't work tomorrow? I am. Well, you know, but if you want to wait until you're going down the, the wrong road and you want to wait until the, the bus is about to fall off the cliff before you call me in, you might have a problem. How do you get them to grasp that, Stephen? Because... As I said, people don't want to change. I mean, that's not true. People want change. They just don't want to change. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, th th there's just so much fascinating research on this. And I think, you know, part of the issue is that we're wired for survival, not innovation. Yes. We only innovate to survive, basically. Yeah. That, that, that really is where it comes down to. So the brain is actually wired to perpetuate the past because the past didn't kill us. Okay, well, good. Let's keep on doing what we've done before. And so to me, the first thing is to 
educate people on this. So for example, confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is sort of a cousin to the things that you were just talking about, which basically says that anytime we get evidence to something that is in contradiction to what we believe, the brain will either filter it out or it will justify it. Yep. And one of the things we know is just pointing out the impact of confirmation bias through a number of experiments we can conduct with our clients. They get to see that they really do have a strong confirmation bias. And by reminding them, we've been able to reduce that about 50% on average. So that's part of it's just awareness. When people understand the way the brain is wired, mm -hmm. they at least now have access to is like, okay, I see the impact of that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think also the other thing which happens is organizationally now, uh, people at the top recognize the need for change. People at the bottom see the pain of not changing. It's the people in the middle who don't want to change in many respects. And so sure. what happens is we, one, one of the great things that technology has done for us in the world of innovation is, is connected the frontline worker to the top executives. Yes. We can use a number of different tools now to get insights that we wouldn't have access to before previously. And so I think that's just a great thing is giving people the ability to run experiments. Uh, there are some companies that do a great job of saying, here's $20, test an experiment. If you can prove it out, we'll give you more money and we'll scale that experiment. Those small scalable experiments to me is the key mindset of a good, innovative and adaptable company. Do you know, do you know specifically of companies that have done that with certain things that have sort of said, here's, here's 20 bucks or here's a hundred bucks, go do something uh, uh, and how it's played out. Can you share that with us? Sure. So, I mean, here in the U.S., it's a controversial company just because of the, the owners, uh, but it's a brilliant company in terms of their ability to do this. It's called Coke Industries, yep. K-O-C-H, out of Wichita, Kansas. Uh, and they use, they have a concept of experimental discovery. And basically their philosophy is no one at the top can have the answers. It's always the people who are down in the trenches who see what's going on. And so what they will do is they will give the people who are down in the local regions money to fund experiments. And these experiments are small and then they scale over time. And it's just amazing some of the incredible things that they've identified. And I'll give you one example Thank you. that they shared with me that I really liked because uh, it almost goes against everything that we believe. So they're, they're in a dangerous industry. A lot of the work that they're into is paper, pulp, petrochemicals, asphalt. I mean, so it's not exactly a safe set of industries. And so they don't want, safety is important to them. They've always been sort of average when it comes to safety. And Charles Koch, the CEO, decided we are now going to focus on uh, safety. We want people to be safer. Now, if you think about how we would typically increase safety in an organization. Most companies go off and hire thousands of safety inspectors scouring the planet, trying to find safety problems. In fact, what they did is exactly the opposite. They mm. empowered the workforce. Right. And they said, we will give you money if you identify a safety issue, and we will give you money if you are able to solve a safety problem. And wow. within one year, they reduced the number of accidents between 30 to 50%, another 30 to 50% the next year. Within just a matter of years, they were one of the top companies for safety in a very unsafe set of industries. So that is that whole point of democratization is you can push that down to the lowest levels and really get some amazing results. Yeah, that is a great example. And yes, they are a controversial company, but that is, I mean, that is a great example of it because they are a very, they're involved in industries that are anything but safe. So I love that they, and I think that so often we get caught in this idea, uh, it, exactly what you were just saying, that the, you know, I pay the CEO, the CMO, the CIO, the C something, uh, all this hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to come up with solutions. But oftentimes that's not where the, where it is. So, I think, and I believe that it's ego that, that gets in the way oftentimes. It's ego that stops them, the, the people at the top from asking the people in the middle or the people at the bottom to, do you see it as an ego thing or is it something else? Sometimes ego plays part of it, but I think sometimes it's human wiring. So there's a great study that just came out not too long ago from Cornell University. And <clears throat> What they did was they asked executives and companies, do you embrace change, creativity, and innovation? And pretty much every single executive said during interviews verbally, yes, we need it, we want it, we have to have it. Right. Then the researchers decided to find out what people really believe. 
and they used a tool that Harvard developed called the Implicit Association Test, which is designed to uncover biases that we have. So do we have a preference for one particular soda over another? And it's really not at a conscious level, but a deep, deep, deep subconscious level. And so they do paired matching. And when they did this, the words change, creativity, and innovation most highly correlated at a subconscious level in the minds of these executives, most highly correlated with the words agony, pain, and vomit. So at a subconscious <laughs> level, yeah, well, and, but it comes back to something you were saying earlier is we, we want ambiguity, but only if it's for almost like a personal satisfaction, but it's not risky. Sure. So whatever is safer yeah. feels like it's going to be the least risky in terms of our survival. And so you could call it ego, but I think it's also just human wiring. We are, most human beings are wired to want to perpetuate what has worked in the past because that is safe. It's why we have best practices. But as you pointed out, my book is best practices are stupid. It's not the way to success, but we still do it because it feels like it's the right thing to do. Yeah. I mean, that in and of itself, like I'm fascinated by when I meet people who say, well, you know, well, what are the best practices in the industry? And they're shocked when I say, I have no idea. And they go, really? I mean, you're, you're an expert and you're a guy. Yeah. The best practices are best practices for that company at that time. And they are now outdated as of last minute. <laughs> it's exactly. crazy. I mean, we just cling, huh? We just, cling so hard one of the things that you and i talked about that i love is that you really believe that the solution is 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 found in in asking better questions um and, and knowing how to ask those questions and you are very keen on that um how would you get i mean aside from the person reading your book and getting the 25 lenses of course so let's imagine you're in a coffee shop talking to uh, one of our listeners, one of our viewers who's, a, who's in the leadership position. And they go, you know, I'm just not that kind of person, which drives me crazy personally. But when somebody says, I'm just not that kind of person. I don't think like that. I'm very, you know, uh, logical step-by-step, step, one, two, three. And this, this creativity thinking is, you know, it's, it's more abstract. And I'm not, kind of, how do you, move our listener, our viewer to say, think about it this way. Well, you're sort of playing right into my hand here because I'm an engineer. That's my background. <laughs> uh, I'm an industrial engineer. I studied probability and statistics and all that. And so I'm really, you know, in some respects, I know the left brain, right brain thing has been debunked, yeah. but, but I'm a left brain kind of guy. You know, I, I like process. I like a repeatable and predictable way of doing things. And I think the reason why innovation has failed to deliver on its promise is because people are treating it as sort of this uh, chaotic, inspirational, it just happens when it happens, whereas it is a process. Mm -hmm. And so really what I do with my clients is I say, look, it can be repeatable. It can, pre -predict can be predictable. I can teach you how to solve any problem and but it, you have to understand it's a process. It's not going to be you sitting around looking at the clouds, waiting for inspiration. That might work for some people, but it doesn't work. And so you need a process and you need a process that asks, helps you ask better questions because it's exactly what you said. If we change the question, like how do I speed up the bags to how do I slow down the passengers? We get a different range of solutions. We can even take that one even further. How do I reduce wait time to how do I improve the wait time? We mm. changed one word has a completely different meaning now because one is about speed. The other one's about experience. Mm. Okay. So if I want to improve the wait time, improve the wait experience, I'm not talking to airports. I live in Orlando right down the road from me is universal studios and Disney. I'm going to talk to them. Right. Now it comes back to where we started. Who do we talk to that has solved problems that are outside of our area of expertise, outside of our industry, shifting the problem, shifting one word in the problem doesn't just give us different solutions. It gives us different places to look to find those solutions. Yeah, it, it's, it's fascinating because uh, I, as you're saying, I'm you know, thinking about airports, I was thinking about Vancouver Airport. And I, I don't know if you've been here in the last 10 years, but we have a brand new airport. It's, it's one of the best in the world now. Um, and as you go down to go through customs and immigration to come into the country, you pass 
all this native, beautiful art and, and a magnificent waterfall. And it's really, you know, all designed with this gorgeous waterfall. And you can hear the, you know, and they're, they're actually re psychologically relaxing you with the sound of the water running over the rocks and the beautiful artwork. And even as you stand in line, and the lines can be long because you've got mass, this is a massive international place. You know, you're looking up at that artwork and you're listening to it. It's so much like somebody said, oh, let's make it less stressful. And that's not a thought not normally in the process, which was so like, I, I will hear from my friends who come down like, my, my friend said, I re he flew from New York first time here. He says, this is a beautiful, like he just went on and on about the airport experience. Now, I know they walk you around to get you. There's like, I know, because I live here, I know you could walk up here, you could, get, you could create a galley up that way, easy. No, I've got to go that way in order to go that way. Okay, there must be a reason for this. But it's like, you're looking at all these glass windows and then you see all this art. So it's, again, it's, it's looking at, at, for things that are people don't think of isn't it it's just i love it i i love the way that your your mind works and i love what you're doing here and helping other people to work with that um do you let, let's just pull things to more contemporary for the moment because one of the things i'm seeing and it drives me a bit crazy to be honest with you is people are moving towards these very reactive solutions that the, the you know, oh my God, COVID is here and, you know, and they're getting reactive. Um, and I know that that's not your way. Can you sort of help people out who are sort of in that knee jerk response to things? Sure. And, and I think that is a natural tendency. I mean, we've of seen course. that play out many, many times in the past, whereas when your survival feels threatened, you, you are going to adapt. You're not even going to adapt. You're going to adopt you're going to reactively adopt anything that is a lifesaver for you. So that, that's natural. Yeah. And I think there's nothing wrong with doing that in the beginning, but right. we have to get out of that. And that's where we are right now, fortunately, is I think we're moving away from this reactive adoption of Zoom as a technology, for example, to a more proactive innovation to really start asking some more important questions. So we could ask questions like the resequence lens is all around how do we change the timing? Right now, we assume everybody has to be on a call at the same time watching things. But if I'm holding a meeting, you think about a typical meeting, it's a five-minute status report, a five-minute status report, a five-minute status report. Why the heck are we wasting everybody's time? Send those status reports through video beforehand. There's so many cool video platforms to do that. Right. And now only spend your time in person having conversations and only with the people who need to be in the room and record it and make sure people come. So the timing, the asynchronous nature of business, I think is so incredibly powerful. And the great thing is, I think it's going to make business better in the long run than it had been in the past because we're learning so many new things in the process. I agree. I think it will make it better. Um, but as, as you said, I think that um, necessity is what kicks innovation into place after a little while. Um, I, let's, I want to bring up a... a a challenge that I'm hearing all the time right now. Uh, and let's sort of walk it through some of these lenses. Sure. Because uh, one, of the, one of the challenges is before COVID or anything was culture. People are always trying to build culture, understand what culture is, how to create a culture. And many companies felt like they had a culture, but a lot of what culture has depended on, because culture is about people, has depended on the interaction between people. And moreover, the... Um, the non-rigidness of that culture, meaning the interaction of people on the fly as you walk down the hallway, as you surround the water machine or whatever it might be, that has suddenly disappeared. You know, now people are not seeing as much of each other. They're certainly not walking down the hallways or, or, you know, or stopping by the office and go, hey, I just had a great idea and I thought I'd share it with you. How, what, what are you sort of seeing as innovative ways to look at that problem um, with a different lens? 
Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of people use technology, obviously, for that right now. Part of it is virtual water coolers, where you just have a room set up and people show up when they want to show up. And so you're able to, I mean, I'm, I'm part of like so many different social hours these days yeah. where, you know, we just get together with no purpose at all. So I yeah. think there's, we're seeing that. Uh, I think also, again, that asynchronous thing, I think is really valuable because I'm, I'm finding that a lot of companies are really trying to take advantage of the fact that a lot of people can't work nine to five right now. They don't want to work nine to five. So how do I create a space where they can at least feel like they're part of a community? So yep. I, I've got a group of people, we use Marco Polo, which is a video chat app. And so, you know, from time to time, just, hey, just good to see everybody here. And it's, it's amazing how you watch the videos of other people and you contribute to the videos. It takes five minutes, 10 minutes. It's really fast, but it feels like you're creating that community that you might've missed. And right. so some companies are doing these frequent check-ins. Okay, every day, just a three-minute check-in on the equivalent of a Marco Polo. How are you doing? What are you, up, what are you up to? Where are you struggling? How can we help you? What's something cool that you did? And that free, like you were talking about, that free-flowing nature, it's not overly rigid. So there's a lot of really great ways to do it. And I think we can do it even more efficiently than we've done it in the past. Mm -hmm. Now I will come back to, this is, this is a conversation I just had last week with a client, which is, you know, how do we people keep people engaged when we can't meet in person? Yep. And, you know, I'm always looking at, first of all, why are, why do we care if people are engaged? We, we say we want people engaged. And of course we do, but what's the outcome? Like what's the problem engagement solves? And so that, and it's gonna be different for different companies. So I think it's really important for us to get clarity around what really matters. Sometimes engagement's around productivity. Sometimes engagement's around, like you said, culture. Sometimes uh, engagement is just around making sure that people are happy so they don't check out. Whatever it is, that's a different problem. And that might give you more specific leverage in terms of finding a solution than engagement because that's so broad in many cases. Well, it seems to me, uh, Stephen, that everything you're doing it with this technology with your book and, and the way you're guiding people is a, is a drill down process. It's always like, you know, because I think that we, all of us like to go to the quick and the, the fast and, and, and we live in a society that wants to be quick and fast and efficient and blah, blah, blah. But oftentimes that's so not where the solution is. And I, and I, as I, as we talked about, I think we find ourselves solving the wrong problem, which creates more problems later on. And, you know, and everything you just described, even like, you know, people are, oh yeah, we've got to keep our people engaged. You know, uh, engagement is so low, but as you just pointed out, why? What's the engagement about? What do you want them engaged in? Well, you know, it's always going to be, I love that. Right. Don't, don't you get yeah. that? Well, you know, yeah, I do. But do you? <laughs> Uh, because I, I know what it is for me, but I have no idea what it is for you. Do you? Oh, yeah. Well, it means, does it? Or is that what you read in the magazine or in the workshop? What does it actually mean for you? I love that you are pushing people to drill down and look, at, look for real solutions to the real problem. So otherwise, we end up giving ourselves a pat on the back for a great job we've done and not doing anything about it. I have a, a friend in the dental business who I said, you know, are you bringing people in to help you? And he said, yes. And I said, who have you brought in? He goes, oh, this one guy who specializes with dentists. I said, oh, that's great. How many people do you know has brought him in? And he said, oh, you know, and he names them off. And I said, oh, great. And I go, what did he charge? He told me. And, he's, and I said, how many of them put it in action? And he goes, oh, one in 20. I said, so why did they bring him in? He says, honestly, I think it's just about bragging rights. Mm. And I go, so they waste tens of thousands of dollars for bragging rights? Wow, that's expensive. And, <laughs> right? and he, I said, why do you think they don't do it? He goes, because the, the guy who comes in tells them they have to change and they don't want to. Okay. <laughs> yep. So really what you want is me to come in with a smoke machine and blow it up your skirt. Okay. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> so who is a company that you look at and you go, they're really doing this well? Really you know, taking on what you're talking about? Yeah, I think there's a, there's a number of companies that I think do exceptionally well f with different pieces of it. So I mentioned USAA. I have a huge amount of admiration for them. Uh, just the way that the message of innovation from the top has gone down to everyone. They really do tap into all 25,000 or so people they have inside the organization to get the most out of them. So I think they do a brilliant job. Uh, I think 
Yeah. I've, I've worked with Marriott for many years now and obviously challenging times for the hospitality industry, but I've, it's just been so fascinating to see them change over time with the acquisition of Starwood and the integration of Starwood and the things that they've been doing. Uh, it's just, you, they're, they're a brilliant company that really takes risks uh, and truly focuses on their differentiator. Coming back to what we talked about before, they're so clear about why people stay with them and why they would go to, to someone else. And they really focus on those experiences, not every single thing that could possibly go wrong. So, I mean, there, there's, there's a number of companies. I mentioned Coke Industries before. They're just a brilliant company in terms of that experimental discovery. Yeah. Uh, so I think there are a lot of companies out there that are doing great things in different pockets. 3M is another one, well-worn example, but I've spent a lot of time there and I've seen, yeah, they really, especially on the R&D side of things, they do a brilliant job of taking their, you know, dozens of different product lines and cross-pollinating across them they've created that culture that you were talking about of collaboration and recognizing I might have a solution in adhesives that could apply to reflectives. Cool. Now I'm going to start collaborating with somebody who's not even in my PL, right. but that's a good thing because we recognize and reward for it. That's fantastic. You said, you know, your background is you're an engineer. Do you think you were always a innovative guy? Whoa, that's a, interesting question because uh sometimes i think what we focus on is the thing that we want to improve in ourselves yeah i've always been a tinkerer i mean growing up i i, I love to i mean i remember one time my dad bought a gas barbecue and he went off and i put the whole thing together as a little kid and i put the whole thing together before he got home i love doing all that uh so i've always been a tinkerer and so i think i gravitated towards innovation because i love tinkering mm. i love trying new things coming back to something you said before, I do get bored sometimes if I'm doing this. I, I'm not a person, I think, who could work in a cubicle nine to five. Uh, during an engineering co-op job, back while I was in, co uh, in, in college and university, uh, I was doing a nine to five job in a cubicle. And it was the greatest thing in the world because I realized I never wanted to do that again. So I worked for Accenture for 15 years, traveling around, different clients every week, doing something different past 20 years, been doing my own thing. It really suits me. You know, one of the things that I love to bring on to, and bring up with my guests is, you know, Stephen, you are so highly respected in what you do um, around the world. And we psychologically human beings tend to look at results and not process. And we forget process. What was something, you know, that you did that blocked you for a long time that you can see now because you're where you are, but looking back, you know, we have this wonderful thing, it's called hindsight, which we're all 2020 on. But when you look back and you think, damn, that, I was really holding myself back with that. What was something that was in your way? I think there were two things. One, I still struggle with in many respects. Uh, you can call it imposter syndrome. You can call it self-limiting beliefs. There's a lot of different words for it. But I do know that for myself, even though I see the results that get produced, there are times when I question me. Mm -hmm. And that's been my, in my business, I know that's probably been my biggest hindrance. Uh, the, the other thing which stopped me was not having a strong belief in the work I was doing. There was, there was a time when I was at Accenture where I was going around and I was, I was a big position. I was traveling the world and I was doing really cool things, but it was all around helping companies optimize their processes. So they were becoming more efficient. And as a result, they were laying off their workforce. Mm -hmm. And when I saw the negative impact on people's lives, when people lost their jobs, I, I took a leave of absence. I took six months off and I had to really think about what I wanted to do. And so I do believe that sometimes the best work we do is when it's aligned with what we, I mean, I always say it's passion, skills, value. You got to love what you do. You got to be good at it. And it has to create value for others. And so when I had that epiphany and I realized I love the work I was doing, but I didn't love the impact. So how could I do the same work with a positive impact? And that's when I created this practice around innovation in 1996 and it's what I've been doing for 25 years because I love it. It creates jobs. It creates wealth. It hopefully stimulates the economy. And it's going to get us out of our current mess right now if we do apply these concepts to think differently. So not being connected to the passion behind, the belief behind what you're doing, doing a job for the sake of doing it to me is just 
torture. But you said something in there that I think is really important for us all to pay attention to. As you know, I talk about finding your dragon fire, which is not your passion. It's not your purpose. And I say it's found in your pain. And the place that, you know, that moment mm -hmm. for you, that soul fire moment where you go, yeah, I'm liking the work. It's a lot of fun and I'm being innovative. But the soul fire moment is that people are getting laid off. And that the cost of that to me at a soulful level was challenging for you. And that's what turned you. And I think that's a really powerful point. So thank you for sharing that with us. I love the, the openness and the vulnerability of that because I think that it's, again, you know, that part of us is attached to the familiar and so easy for us to go, Hey, I got a great job. I got a nice living. You know, I was having a conversation a, a while back with John Perkins who wrote the, the economic hitman. And he was talking about, you know, being this guy who was having dinner with, with the, the kings and the and leaders of the world and realizing I'm, a, I'm kind of a douchebag. <laughs> I don't like it. And he had to completely change his life. Very difficult to give up that kind of like tearing off your own skin to walk away from that guarantee of certainty and safety of, you know, well, and, and the justification of, well, I love the work and I'm doing good work. And then that soulful moment. Do you, you know, you said you took a, a leave of absence. Can you talk to us a little bit about that, that time? Was that difficult yeah. for you? Oh, that was probably one of my darkest uh, moments in business. Uh, and I love the way you just framed it because that, that, that was just so spot on. It wasn't about loving what I do, but I felt the pain of what I was doing before. So to sort of complete the story just a little bit, as I was working on a project where the CEO announced that 10,000 people were going to lose their job. And I was watching a TV show about three executives from that company, my client, three executives who lost their jobs a year previously. And one guy uh, was living off an inheritance. The second guy was mowing lawns for a living and cried the entire interview. And the third guy committed suicide. Oh, my goodness. So it was that TV show when I saw, okay, 10,000 people losing a job. Okay, well, that's, that, that sucks. But okay, people are losing jobs. They'll find something better. No. When I saw that TV show, I literally walked off the project that day and that TV show was on my mind for those six months. And I spent a lot of time on beaches and meditating and taking classes and just trying to figure out what the heck am I doing? Like, uh, how am I going to create something that's going to have a positive impact? Cause to me, that was just so important. And I didn't want it to be just a knee jerk reaction against what I saw. So it really had to be very purposeful and thought out. And so it was a very difficult six months. And then when I got clear what I wanted to do, which was to create this practice around growth, well, then it was difficult because I had to sell it. And it wasn't easy to sell it inside of a group that was entrenched in technology. And, but eventually I found the right people who totally supported it. And boom, and then all of a sudden, once you sort of turn that corner, it just flows and what, what we created I mean, even though this is almost 25 years ago now, I will still say that what we created back then is probably some of my proudest moments of my entire career because it was just amazing what we were able to mobilize in a short amount of time. And so many people fear turning into that fire, turning into that pain. And I understand it. I'm not pretending I don't understand it. I do. And I'm not saying that it's easy. It's not. You just said it's not easy. But the payoff is spectacular because... Yeah, it'll fill your bank account eventually, but you'll always come up against massive resistance first, um, but it will fill your heart and your soul, and that's so powerful. Thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate it. As we come to the end, I'm going to, of course, ask you to share uh, how people can find you and find out about your books, and I'll, I know you have a ton of resources. But before we do that, just one of the things I always like to finish with is please tell our, share with our, our listeners, our viewers, a practical thing they can go do, preferably right away, certainly within the next 24 hours that will really allow them to integrate what it is you've been sharing because information is worth the hole in the donut. Transformation comes from application. So given that uh, all the questions we ask and the work that we do is built around assumptions, sometimes the best way to figure out what assumptions we have is just to stop whatever you're doing and just say, what do I believe to be true? Mm -hmm. What don't I believe to be true? What do I think is right? What do I think is wrong? And then really be thoughtful about, is that really the case? And then a lot of times things that assumptions we make, beliefs that we have aren't 
they aren't accurate. They're just based on past or faulty information. And I think sometimes just that one thing is that I, I call it the pause button because we're running around. Survival mode is doing, 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 reacting, 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 escaping threat, escaping threat. But if you put the pause button on, just say, what problem am I solving? Is it really valuable? Is it differentiating? Is it important? What assumptions am I making? And you just do that one thing, even if it's just 10 minutes to push that pause button on a project you're working on, you're going to start to see opportunities you've never seen before. They're right in front of your nose. You just can't see them because the questions you're asking aren't opening up the possibility. Superb. Um, and, you know, I, I, there's a lot of stuff, even in that last thing you just said there, but just even if people went away and said, what problem am I actually solving? Most people will discover they're not. They're actually not, which is, it, that in and of itself, we, I mean, we can take that section and go, okay, that's it. That's the show. It's fantastic. Walk away. You've got it. Stephen, this has been a pleasure and honor, sir. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Uh, I want to thank you on behalf of our viewers, our listeners, and myself. Please share with us where we can find out more about you, your books, your, your, all of your wonderful resources. So to find out about me, steveshapiro.com. That's the simple place. Uh, but the place where I'd have a lot of people go, because we talked about these lenses and yep. they're available for free. If you go to invisiblesolutionsresources.com, there's videos and downloads and templates and the 25 lenses and everything else. And to me, that's just a great place to start the journey because you can get started solving problems immediately using the process without buying a thing. Fantastic. Thank you, sir. It's been a pleasure and honor. I hope you will stay with us to the end. And for you, dear listener, remember that you can hang out with other conscious leaders and chat about this episode or any past episodes by going into our Facebook or LinkedIn groups. Just look for the Leadership and Loyalty Podcast. It doesn't matter how successful you are. If your employees and your customers don't understand what gives your company meaning, you're only working at a fraction of your true capability. To find out how you can hire me, Dov Barron, as a leadership speaker or leadership strategist or executive advisor for yourself or your organization, go to Dov baron.com that's d-o-v-b-a-r-o-n.com because unified meaning or as we call it you're finding your dragon fire is the one single monolithic difference between mediocrity and greatness for individuals and companies i want to thank you for sharing the show with everybody you know till next time stay curious my friend stay curious about the questions you're asking and whether they those questions are actually facilitating your bias or whether they're facilitating real solutions and innovation. I'm Dal Baron. I'm here to assist you tapping into your dragonfire. Fire.